Welcome to Power Lunch Live. I'm Rep Power, your host. Uh, we do this program every Monday, Tuesday, no, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and a lot of Fridays. Um, we've got a great show today. I'm looking forward to it. The point of the show, though, is to have best-selling authors, CEOs, corporate leaders, people who are do, is it doing amazing work in the world that we can all learn from, that we can all take uh, from this show and we can go back and, and apply in our own businesses and our own organizations. Uh, now, the fun part about that is that the show can be interactive, but you've got to ask questions in order for that to happen. Now, you can do that on LinkedIn. You can do that on Facebook. You can do it on Twitter and you can do that on uh, YouTube. Uh, I think you can also do it on Twitch, but I don't know how to work, work on Twitch. So uh, you're on your own on Twitch if you do it there. Um, so uh, if you like the program, give it a like or share and uh, so that your network can benefit from the conversations and we get the side benefit of growing our audience. Now, today I, I've got a, a, an amazing person that I can't wait for you to meet. Uh, doc, and you've probably already, uh, hopefully already read the book. Uh, Dr. Steven Rogelberg, he holds the title of Chancellor's Professor at UNC Charlotte. Uh, he is a professor of organizational science, management, and psychology. His work has been featured on uh, NPR, uh, CBS, Chicago, the Ch Chicago Tribune, LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, to just name a few, uh, and Washington Post. Uh, his new book is called The Surprising, best-selling book, The Surprising Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance. Uh, Stephen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's really, it's fun to do this. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I you know, I wanted to have you on the program because I think we all think as leaders and people who hold meetings that we do it well. And if I read the book correctly, we're probably not doing it. So, <laughs> and so I wanted to have you on so that we could all learn from, sure. from your work because it is, it's science-based, it's research-based, and I think it's spot on. And so I want to know what inspired you to write the book? I mean, 15 years of research, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, so I'm an organizational psychologist. Okay. And as an organizational psychologist, um, you know, my passion is doing research on topics that are really frustrating to people and right. with the hope of trying to provide some evidence based solutions to make things better. And definitely meetings fit that bill, right? I mean, uh -huh. they're are so many of them and frustrations at an all time high. And then personally, you know, meetings drive me bonkers. And uh, so when you put that all together, it was, it was a perfect storm um, that I, I wanted to engage on this topic. And to my surprise, there really was not much research at all uh, going on around it. That's, a, that's incredible. And if I read correctly, you, you talk about 55 million meetings a day and just in the U.S. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's staggering the amount of time, the, the, I mean, the amount of money that's costing sure. for something that's not working really. Yeah, I mean, and you know, when you, you can exactly. think of it as time, you can think about it as money, you can also think about it as opportunity costs, right? People yeah. could be doing something else that was constructive. Um, yeah. But we also know from our research that there are some, um, you know, fatigue and drain and stress consequences of poorly run meetings. Uh, we even have some data to suggest that something called meeting recovery syndrome. You got to be me. There's a syndrome and, from it. <laughs> so like this, this idea when you have a bad meeting, you just don't leave it at the door. It, it affects your performance and productivity after the meeting as well. Okay. Well, what is, uh, you know, you have to, so, so the next, obviously the next question is, what are the biggest complaints? What are, where are we falling down on the job as meeting leaders? Uh, I mean, what, what's the, in, in that research and that, that, sure. that you found, what, what is the biggest complaint that you, that you hear or complaints, I guess? Yeah. It's really better to think of it as a constellation of complaints. Okay. Um, <laughs> as opposed to just once. Um, you know, I, I do want to say at the, at the onset that I think what our research generally shows is that 
um, there's not a good meeting and a bad meeting. That typically in almost any meeting, there's some proportion of that time that's good right. and there's some proportion that's bad. Um, so there's this ratio. And right now we're finding around 50% of the time is not an effective use of time. Okay. Which I think is incredibly high. Um, you imagine if everything in life, only 50% of the, of the time it was, it was good, that, I think that would suggest that you're not making good choices. Right. Um, so what are the, some of the common complaints during the not effective time? Um, so some of the common complaints could be, I don't know why I'm there. Okay. I'm not needed. Um, it could be uh, that there are people that are dominating the conversation, steamrolling their ideas, not truly listening to other people. It's a leader that's not truly embracing their role as a leader. Right, they're observing all these poor dynamics and not owning that it's their job to make them better. It could be a meeting that's overly bloated, just too many people in it, so that there's just a dysfunction that occurs due to the size of the group. People talking over one another, um, co uh, pressures to conform, you know, kind of this notion of groupthink. So those are some of the, th the syndromes that you see in the ineffective time. Seems to me, I, and, and I, I think you mentioned this in the book, and I can't remember the name of the, it's completely blanked on it, but where we naturally s s fill the space. So if we schedule an hour, we're going to fill an hour, where, whereas if you did that over 30 minutes, and I can't think of the name of the... the, the I can. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's called Parkinson's Law. That's it. That's it. I knew. I knew it was. I knew it was. It was in my brain somewhere. Um, so explain that. Sure. Because that's, I think that's fascinating. Well, thank you. Uh, so Parkinson's law is the idea that work expands to fill whatever time is allotted to it, and the research is really pretty powerful around this concept. So it's so when if you schedule a meeting, for example, for an hour, magically right. it will take an yeah. hour, right? <laughs> And so this is works to be a, a real challenge in uh, meetings in that typically the default option on our scheduling programs is an hour. So lo and behold, meeting after meeting after meeting is an hour. Um, right. And that's just not a good reason. Um, you know, we have to determine meeting times in a much more strategic, thoughtful way and not be locked into just this notion of an hour um, given Parkinson's law. And so does it, does it help us to put some pressure on ourselves to sort of get it done? I mean, is there a benefit to saying this is an hour, we, we normally do this an hour, we're going to cut it down to 30 minutes and we're going to, we're going to, go, we're going to go through the, I mean, it, exactly. kind of like I, I remember when I was in, in college, right. And I got, I've got a term paper, do right. I I, I waste sure. the last minute, and I then I crunch to get it done. But I get it done. Right. And, um, right. Well, we know again. Uh, the research is pretty strong on this that uh, you can seem to perform optimally on some level of pressure, and it's kind of like an um, you know an inverted U shaped relationship, right? So okay. no pressure leads to less than optimal performance. Moderate levels of pressure seem to lead to optimal performance. Too much pressure results in poor performance again. So we want to find that sweet spot, right, of having reasonable amounts of pressure, thus promoting focus. And I think that's where uh, this concept, you know, if we think a meeting is going to take, you know, an hour, yeah, let's try to do it in 40 minutes. You know, we don't want to be unreal, you know, unreasonable, but... Right. There's also something really powerful about trying to use Parkinson's law to our advantage and not our disadvantage. What I, I, one of the things I was I was really interested about was that, that it's sort of the leader's responsibility to frame the meeting and, and manage the meeting. But I like what you talked about in terms of the reframing it in terms of questions. Can you explain that? Because sure. I, I found that really interesting. Well, thank you. Um, so when you think about agendas, um, most agendas are organized as a set of topics to be discussed, right? In this meeting, we're going to cover topic A, B, C, D. 
Well, there's an alternative. The alternative is framing your agenda as a set of questions to be answered. Mm -hmm. And this is a very powerful change. When a meeting leader has to try to create a set of questions, mm -hmm. they have to think at a much deeper level, right? They have to truly think about, well, what, what are the outcomes we actually want from this? So they think more, they become more intentional. By organizing your meetings, a set of questions, you have a better sense of who to invite to the meeting because they're relevant to the questions. You know when to end a meeting because the <laughs> questions have been answered. Right. And if you just can't think of any questions, that might be your indication that a meeting is not necessary. No meeting, right. <laughs> no, that, that just makes so much sense to me. It really just makes so much sense to me. And it, it, you don't get off track, right? You're, you're trying to answer a specific question. Sure. And, it's, and, it, and it gives a level of focus to the meeting too, to me. Uh, I agree. I agree. What? I mean, even think about your world, right? You're, you do so many interviews. Um, you think about your questions in advance. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't be nimble, but the fact that you've thought about these questions in advance creates an opportunity for more meaningfulness and more respect for your guest's time. Right. There's no, if there's a focus to it, right? Yeah. And that, that's, that's what it does. What is, uh, the other thing I, I, I was really curious about is the power of silence because in meetings, I think we're all under the impression that we've got to give, we've got to talk, we've got a, there's a dialogue. And you talk about brainstorming in silence. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Silence could be um, one of the most powerful meeting tools and it is an interactive tool. Um, so first let me share a, a research finding. Uh, so there is research that has compared groups who brainstorm in silence basically just jotting their ideas down on index cards or into an app versus groups that brainstorm with their mouths. And what they found is that those groups who brainstorm in silence generate nearly twice as many ideas. But maybe wow. more importantly, the ideas tend to be more innovative and more disruptive. So let's think about why that would be the case. When you're brainstorming in silence, Everyone can talk at once, <laughs> right? You're no longer right. waiting for that person to speak. Furthermore, one person's contribution is not affecting your view of the challenge, right? So you're able to bring your full self to the ideation process. Right. And number three, you're not filtering based on what the boss said. Right. Right. So you have these forces that are just the perfect conditions for excellent brainstorming. And then, you know, from silence and brainstorming, you know, that can, that can evolve to the next stage, right? So let's say that you do it on index cards or the app, you know, basically you have one idea per card, but then, you know, the app can help you sort these things into piles based on conceptual similarity. And then the group can use an app to vote on which pile they think has the most merit. Again, this is all interaction. It's just not with voices. Yeah. And then, then you could even have the situation, I'm just going to take it even further, that um, the group looks at various ideas and they can just start typing in reactions and thoughts and people could respond to other people's thoughts. So you can build a highly interactive environment without a word being spoken. Now, in the example I just shared, it was silence, 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 silence. It doesn't have to be that way. There's not a magic formula. Um, right. we, and that's, I think, one of the things that's really powerful about the book is I don't say that to have a good meeting, you have to do this, this, and then that. Because the, the, the science doesn't support that. What the science supports is, is a leader making good choices, being intentional, Intentional. Yeah. Not just falling into habits, but make choices. Um, make choices and honor people's time. So silence is this opportunity that given what you want to accomplish and who's at the meeting, you can say, you know what? I think silence might be a perfect tool 
to getting it done. It does not mean you should do it every single meeting. Because <laughs> then it would become just an annoying habit again. But it's so, a tool that's available to a meeting leader. No, I, I mean, it's fascinating. That I, but you're absolutely right because I, I've been in these meetings where one or two voices control and they and 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 people fall in line yes. intentionally or not int not intentionally yes right and 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 I've been f guilty of uh, facilitating meetings where I don't think everybody got the same voice right and we probably missed missed things that were important because of that so I I totally get that and I, and I, I I'm actually eager to try to implement that because I think that that that's what you how you explained it is really really powerful and and just it could be game changing to to a lot of people, particularly to get just to make people feel inclusive, included in yeah. in in things that, you know, we all have unconscious bias. We all have uh, faults. Right. And we all um, and, and some people are not. A sh some people do speak up and they speak up loudly when others who probably have good ideas don't talk. And um, and so I, I, I like that a lot. What um for you are the are sort of the the keys to running a good meeting i know that that there's no one one thing but i know you've got like seven or ten ideas of like some of the basics like I have what two million ideas like in the what, book. right you got two million in the book right? <laughs> <laughs> and there were seven random ones right, That's right. <laughs> um so i'll just share two that i think um okay are meaningful. And um, so if, if I had a, to, I had a leader come to me and say, Hey, listen, I want to make my meetings better. Um, I want to, I do. I want to make my meetings better. Okay. Tell me. And I can't say buy the book. So I, I, I'll, <laughs> I won't throw that away, but I won't throw that, that out there. So I, I would say, first of all, embrace a different mindset. Uh, embrace this mindset of being a good steward of others' time. A okay. steward of others' time. Once we have that mindset, we actually start to think about our meetings very differently. When we have that mindset that, you know, that we want to be a good steward, we start to make good choices. We start to think more carefully about the meeting and what success looks like. We think more carefully about who needs to be there. We fully recognize that while so many com people complain about meetings, we don't want them to complain about our meetings, right? We want to be part of the solution. So just embracing this different mindset. And interestingly, we have this mindset all the time when it comes to meeting with customers or a boss's boss, right? We don't want those people to leave the meeting saying, boy, that was a waste, right? right. That would crush us. So we're motivated to make sure that we maximize the time of that powerful individual right but when it comes to meeting with our directs or our peers we just typically don't have that same mindset so that's really an overarching general notion of the importance of mindset and then something more specific um and i'm going to go um unconventional um okay. is if you had to if you if you force me to say what should a leader actually do I would say, I want you to evaluate your meetings. I want you to send a quick survey, you know, use Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey, whatever it is, to the people who attend your regularly occurring meetings and ask them, what's going well, what's going not so well, and what can we do differently? Okay. Get the data, right? There's nothing more powerful to improving your meetings than understanding how individuals are experiencing your meetings. Take right. the challenge. Meeting leaders are not engaging in that simple act. And they're now when you kind of think of these two things, what does a steward do? A steward cares about other people's opinions, which is then solved by that second point asking people's opinions. And right. when you learn what's on their minds about what's going not so well, then try new things. The beauty right. of 55 million meetings a day is there's lots of opportunities to try to get better. What is, um, 
in, in any of the research that you did, are there uh, adding humor, adding, uh, uh, I mean, what, what are some things, where are, are some, or do you have some examples of people who do some really creative things? I mean, you've talked to so many people about this. Sure. I'm just asking, like, what are some fun things that you could do to make them make some of these, you know, I have a Monday morning meeting, right? And it's, right. everybody has a Monday morning meeting and how do I, get that to be more exciting? So first of all, it, it's a neat question um, because one of the things that we know is that the mood of a meeting actually matters. That when there's generally a positive mood state in the meeting, people tend to be more creative. They tend to listen to each other more um, carefully. Um, and they tend to engage in more constructive decision making. So mood matters. Okay. Interestingly, the best predictor of collective mood is actually the mood state of the leader. Right. So what you bring into that room is really critical. Now, with kind of narrowing down my thinking, so what makes for a fun meeting? And or is that necessary? I mean, like the I, I, like question was really around the mood, right? Okay. How do Good. you? Yeah. Like, how do you how do you get it, you know, where people are uplifted? Because sure. that's what you want. I like it. Um, so I think the, the the main thing is for a leader to um, kind of recognize that they're a host and they are a host. Right. They call this gathering together. So what are some of the things that a good host does? A host welcomes people. A host expresses appreciation. A host thanks people for giving them their time. A host makes introductions when people don't know each other. A host starts the meeting off strong, right? Really clarifying while, why everyone is there. And then sometimes, maybe you might be guessing where this is going, the best host has snacks. There you go. There's nothing wrong with having some snacks at a meeting. Right. But I do want to also circle back to something that you said, is that there's research that looks at humor and meetings. Okay. And what they find, so in general, humor comes in two flavors, right? There's, there's the kind of the more friendly, constructive humor, and then there's this really biting humor that comes at the expense of others. Right, right. Well, that constructive, more positive humor is actually associated with better meeting performance. So nice. there's a clear linkage. So your meeting having some humor in it is a good thing. Um, but I don't want leaders um, to feel like they have to manufacture this. It's similar to when I do training of teachers. Okay. You know, what I try to do when I train teachers is I say, you know, find your voice. Right? You don't need to copy my voice. Find your voice. How can you display passion? And passion can be displayed in lots of different ways. Passion is displayed by preparation. Right. Right? Passion is displayed by being focused and fully present. So there's lots of things that meetings leaders can do to create kind of a, a joyful environment. But I want to I want to close with this with one final thought around this question that a high quality meeting leads to joy. Yeah. Right? So we often think that joy leads to high quality meeting. But when people feel their time is valued, when there's a good interaction, when that leader is facilitating, those things just promote a sense of positivity. Indeed. No, that's, that's so true. One minute. One quick question that just came up as I was thinking about this in today's world. So many people, and, and I think this is a huge challenge for organizations. So many people have remote workers now and trying to bring remote teams together in a meeting online through you know, Skype or Zoom or whatever the platform is. Is that a challenge that, what do you, what's your take on that challenge? Yeah, so, um, you know, remote meetings... I know you got to go, but... <laughs> it's, it's no, it's fine. A... Remote meetings are absolutely wonderful for bringing folks together, um, you know, 
It, it bridges incredible distances. Um, it's a wonderful innovation in meetings. But at the same time, dysfunction tends to elevate in these remote meetings. Um, okay. You know, when I when you do survey research of what's the most dysfunctional meeting type, people will typically say the remote meeting. But interestingly, if you do a survey saying, what meeting type do you most prefer to attend? Remote meetings. <laughs> and so why is that? Why do you think that's the case? I, I'm perplexed. So because they can multitask. Ah, uh, okay. So they can do other things. Yeah. Well, that gives you a really clear state of the problem. So therefore, a meeting leader kind of running a remote meeting, they have to take it to the next level. Okay. They have to do whatever they can to um, make these meetings m more visible. So when people could just fade into the background, they experience something called social loafing, which is a reduction of their own personal effort in the face of others. Okay. And that's really what prompts this um, multitasking. So when at all possible, you do video based, right? right. Um, leaders are really playing the role of an air traffic controller. They're calling folks out. They're saying, hey, Gordon, what are your thoughts about this? Sasha, I haven't heard from you. Tell me where, what you're thinking about this, right? So they are just being really active with the facilitation. They might even be keeping a record of who's talking and who's not talking because it's on them to try to address that. Right. Um, they're thinking very carefully about, you know, who really needs to be there. Um, I'm a big fan of changing the cadences around remote meetings. So keep them short and then have um, in between meeting time. So let's say we have a remote meeting to set up a problem, a challenge. Well, after that meeting, we could then throw a document in a Google Doc and tell people, hey, start generating solutions and start making comments on other people's solutions. And then we'll see where we're at. So right. you want to use meeting intervals more strategically because these remote meetings have some limitations and challenges. Right. And then one of the uh, most controversial things that I've said in my book that has actually gotten me in trouble, but if you really read the, the book, it's not controversial, is I talk about how leaders and attendees of remote meetings should strive to have their meeting such that they do not need to push the mute button. Okay. Now let's think about this for a moment. If you ban the mute button, what's then required of everyone? They have to talk. They have to talk. They have to be in a quiet place. They can't be walking their dog. They can't be eating their lunch. They can't be going to the bathroom. They have to be present. That's right. So I like this idea of striving for a mute free, you know, that the mute button is not an option. Because if you think about it, when we're in the workplace, right, people don't have to mute themselves when they're sitting in a meeting, right? They're yeah. quiet, right? They are present. So I want to I want to work, and I think this is what I, I talk about in the book are different strategies for doing this is trying to create a remote meeting where everyone is truly present. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I love the not, the, the, the no mute button. I, um, I, but I'm guilty of the multitasking. I have to, I have to, to confess. You're not alone. You're not <laughs> alone. Um, hey, this has been great. This has been a, a fantastic conversation and, and, and so, thank you so much for your, your time. Uh, the book is The Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance. Uh, we'll put a link on the on the program notes to the show, uh, on the show to the book. And uh, any final words on the book that you want to talk about? Um, well, um, I'd love for folks to come to my website, um, thesurprisingscience.com. Um, or go to my website, stephenrogelberg.com. I have additional resources uh, there. Um, and um, I certainly hope that people will check out the surprising science of meetings. And, the, and you also speak. So if you you can book that for, you can be in contact with you through, through the website there, if, if they want to have you come and, and give your, your talk, because I think it's pretty powerful. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. 
out there for spending your your lunch hour or your morning with us, depending on where you are in the in the world. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon at uh, twelve noon. Uh, if you want to check out the upcoming uh, schedule, it's powerlunch.live, powerlunch.live. And we also do conventions and uh, events. We can bring the, the show on the road. Uh, so uh, be in touch with us if you're, in, you're interested in having a LinkedIn Live at your event or, or our conference. And until uh, tomorrow, have a good day. Go out and do good work.